We are undoubtedly in election season, and it looks like there's a couple of topics we as investors need to talk about. One of them is rent control, and the other is tariffs. Both of these could have impacts on your life, on your business. So let's have a conversation about both of them. We're going to do that today with Casey from Brick by Brick Wealth. How are you doing, Casey? I'm doing good, Michael. Thanks for having me on today. It's been a wild week for me with a lot going on. So I'm happy to do something normal today and talk to you. <laughs> Let's just take a deep breath, realize that we can have a friendly conversation about, in yeah. this case, rent control and tariffs. Because again, it, it's possible that one, if not both of these could happen. And I think it's uh, it's nice to plan or look ahead. Uh, let's go to rent control first. Uh, I obviously invest in the state of California. Our king, a.k.a. Gavin, um, decided to ignore the people. Uh, we actually had a vote in California four or five years ago on rent control. It was declined or voted against. But because he is king, he created rent control. So I've been having rent control in California for the last four or five years. Not sure if you have rent control where you are, but Biden is talking about national rent control. So uh, what say you? I say no on rent control. I mean, I, I'm from California, right? And I haven't lived there in 12 years, but a couple of years ago, I had a student who wanted to buy a duplex, a house hacking duplex in Los Angeles. And they were, it was like a million dollar duplex, uh, tiny 400 square foot units in this like prestigious, walkable, like most amazing area. She was having a hell of a time trying to find a place she could buy because of rent control, because the tenants that were there, um, I think we, there was one complex we, uh, you know, duplex we found and one of the tenants was over 65 years old and they were paying $1,200 a month and they had been there for years and rent was supposed to be $5,000 market rent was $5,000 for that little place. They're paying 1200 bucks and that property had been on the market for a very long time because you have to buy it with the tenant and you have to extend their lease, right? If they're paying, especially if they're over a certain age, I mean, and, and a lot of times, and we weren't even really trying to go here, but a lot of times, um, you have to buy out your tenants to move and people are paying like 50, $75,000 to get tenants to move out of properties because why would you leave a $1,200 a month place in a prime location to pay 5,000 somewhere else? Like you need a huge tenant buyout for that. So, you know, this is just one, we've seen rent control in California and what it's done. Now imagine, imagine that being nationwide. Yeah. I think rent control is one of those interesting things because, again, rent control is something I studied getting my economic degree. Right? It's, it's actually, economic degree. It's, it's, it's one of those topics you talk about. And I now have not only that, but practical experience. There is a long history of well-meaning folks who think rent control will solve things. One of the things that you highlighted that very rarely gets discussed is if you win the lottery and are lucky enough to get a rent controlled unit, like paying twelve hundred in a five thousand dollar area, you you won the lottery. You won the housing lottery. It is rent control is amazing for a couple of people. Where it breaks down is you don't have turnover. They don't move. Even with life events, I mean, if you really want to get crazy with it, you can watch the TV series, the sitcom Friends, where Monica and Rachel lived in this rent-controlled unit that her grandmother lived in, right? They inherited that way. So they stay in the family. So again, rent control is amazing for few, but it is horrible for most. Because if you don't win the lottery, you don't win the lottery, right? You're out. And there's not enough turnover for you to get a chance. So that's that. That's on the tenant side. Where it really gets kinky is if you have a rent-controlled unit, and New York is suffering this right now again, and you have taxes go up and maintenance go up, but you can't raise the rent to cover cost, the only answer is landlords stop doing maintenance. They do band-aids. They ignore things. And what happens very quickly is the condition of quality units deteriorates because it's 
not practical to fix them. In fact, sometimes it's better to have them empty than fixed. So that is a reality. And then um, lastly, it doesn't help supply. I mean, come on, folks. We are living in a world where we don't have enough units. And if you're going to put rent control on something, not only is existing quality going to go down, but you're not going to get help from new units. So it's just all kinds of bad, except for the few people that win the lottery. Uh, yeah. So that's my feeling about rent control. For me, you know, I understand California and I've seen kind of how that goes down over time. But living in Memphis, really, there's no, you know, downtown L.A., like Westlake Village, whatever area that people that going to increase in rent like that. We're talking middle of America, very poor, a lot of these very poor areas. And it's already difficult for landlords and property owners to cash flow already with housing prices, with interest rates. Everyone's already working on a thin margin. So now you're going to say that we can only raise our rents 5%. And what if, you know, between tenants, I say, hey, which we do a lot, a lot. We put in quality tenants. We do quality renovations. So what's now my incentive as a small mom and pop landlord and a rental property owner to redo the kitchen, upgrade the bathroom so I can get that extra hundred bucks a month in rent. If I can't get that anymore, what's going to happen? Like you said, to the quality of housing across the board, it's going to go down. Across the board, it's going to go down because now with Biden's thing, he's saying if you own 50 units or more, but hey, that's a gateway drug right there. That 50 units or more for corporations only gateway drug to long-term rent control for everyone across the board. You give them a little bit and they're going to go crazy. You know, give them an inch, take a mile. This is, this is bait and switch. Okay. We can't fall for this. And I know this, if this gets passed and it's temporary for two years, that's going to get extended because- you know, it didn't flatten the curve enough. So we have to keep going for more and more years for rent control. And then now it didn't do enough for the large corporations. We have to do rent control for these small mom and pops too. And that's me, okay? And I I'm not incentivized no longer to fix up my properties because guess what? Owning rentals is not a charity. I don't do this for charity. I don't have a 501c3 corporation. I am not here to save the planet. I'm here to provide a service. I'm here to keep my community nice and good shape. I live here too. I live in my community that I rent to, okay? So I want to provide quality properties in exchange for, you know, a quality place to live in exchange for payment. Well, it's going to yeah. be harder for me to provide a quality place if I can't make any money. So then what's going to happen? I'm going to have to sell my houses. Doesn't make sense. Maybe uh, there's another market for me, or maybe rentals ends up not really working out. So now what do we have? We have less properties available for rent. Now we're going to have maybe more government housing, okay? And people don't really want that, you know? Not only do they, people want, really, they want landlords. They don't even want big property management companies. I landlord myself, Michael, and I can't tell you the amount of times people say, you're an owner? Yes, mm. I'm the owner when I call because owners take better care of their properties and even property management companies, property management companies take better care than these huge corporations more than these big government entities. So yeah. we have to be careful what we ask for and what we wish for because it yeah. just trickles down and it's not really helping the American people. It's not really helping our citizens like it seems like it's going to. Again, rent control feels good. Well-meaning folks trying to do things that they think will fix. Again, I'll go back to simple economic supply and demand. We have a supply problem, not a demand problem. Uh, I agree with you. If you change the economics in rentals, you will see landlords sell, which maybe is a good thing. But you got to remember, uh, when you start selling off rental units, you have less supply because some people have to rent, right? Not everybody's a homeowner. And um, yeah, it. I mean- there's a uh, famous uh, Swedish economist who said the the best something like the best way to, to draw, destroy a city other than bombing it is rent control. So that should tell you. And this guy's a socialist, and he said that. So that's pretty cool. Well, let's flip the script and talk tariffs. The other side of the fence is talking tariffs. We're talking adding 20, 40, 60 percent for imports. Uh, undoubtedly, tariffs will be inflationary, in my opinion. Undoubtedly, there will be some tit for tat on tariffs, which means our exports will get more expensive. Uh, but yeah, if you put tariffs on imports, 
That just means stuff costs more. That's how I see it. It's so funny, Michael, because you know we're homeschooling now, right? And mm -hmm. we're homeschooling now. And we started, me and my three kids, we started homeschooling at the beginning of July, already getting in the groove, making sure it's going to work out. And the first thing that we started learning about was the Silk Road. Now, the Silk Road was an old trade route from Italy to China. And it's the beginnings, kind of the formation of America and the understanding of how trade worked with countries. So with this whole tariff thing going on, I'm getting to explain to my kids how does this, how would this affect today's economy? How is it affecting us now? What would change and all those things? So on the other hand, too, my husband works for a speaker company. And he, him, him and his company, right, they design speakers, car speakers, audio stuff in China, and they sell it in the U.S. So what, though it's easy to understand, well, what happens when the imports start costing more? It's just passed down to the consumer. Now, I get it, right? We want to create more industry, more jobs in America. And I tried to explain this to my daughter. I said, Juliet, your, your iPhone is made in China. There is cheap labor in China. There's cheap labor overseas, right? So it might cost 50 bucks to make your cell phone. Well, we want to make your cell phone in America. Your cell phone might cost you, instead of $1,000 to buy, $10,000 to buy because of the wages that we, the minimum wage and all these things that we have to pay American workers. And she's like, well, crap. I don't want to buy my cell phone in America. Now, I understand punishing countries, right? I understand the gist of tariffs and keeping work in the country. I'm not an economist, Michael, but I know that something like this is going to take years to iron out. I would love, I would love cars to be made in America. I would love for as many things as possible to be made in America. But we can't forget too that in the short term, especially with what we have going on, it's going to cost consumers and Americans a grip. If things are all of a sudden tariffed, you know, and we're having to pay, pay the price as consumers, it's just going to get passed down, just like minimum wage increase. The day that California raised minimum wage to 20 bucks, the day, in and out raised their price, the day. That's just how it works. So, yeah. you know, I agree with the tariff. I agree with the concept. Um, but it's really going to hurt us, in my opinion, as consumers buying the stuff that we know and love every day. It's going to cost more. Yeah, as the economist here, I mean, I look at tariffs and I really acknowledge a couple of things. If you want to take tariffs as a sledgehammer, which I mean by that, everything that comes in, we're adding 50%. I'm just making a number up. That's what I call a sledgehammer. That is undoubtedly going to make inflation go higher. It just, it, oh, yeah. It just, it can't. So um, if you think 2.5% inflation is bad, you know, wait till we have four and a half for, for the foreseeable future. Because what happens, again, the system, the system will work itself out where if imports are, you know, went from costing 100 to costing 200, eventually U.S. manufacturing will spin up and produce something at 180. But there will be a shoosh, one, two, three, four year period as that stuff starts working. That is just ridiculously painful. That's if it's a sledgehammer. That said. Um, this whole talk track, I think, is really going to be implemented as a scalpel. What do I mean by that? I think there are some goods that have to be manufactured here. Um, I'm thinking pharmaceuticals is the greatest example. The fact that we rely on countries that don't like us to supply those is, in my opinion, a national security risk. So if you treat tariffs like a scalpel, you could come out and tax those things a lot, which will encourage U.S.-based manufacturers to spin up. If you do that and you add incentives around manufacturing, you could you could really go somewhere. So um, again, tariffs, as currently discussed as a sledgehammer, will lead to inflation. It can't otherwise. Maybe, maybe that's the right answer long term. Maybe that regenerates the manufacturing base in the U.S. If you're, again, I, I'm not here to judge. If that's the plan in three or four years, we have a reinvigorated manufacturing industry, great. Just realize the next two to three years are going to suck uh, because everything costs more. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, rent control and tariffs have unintended consequences, and both of them could hurt investors and hurt 
consumers if we're not careful and if we don't uh, do them well. What do you think? I think it's you're absolutely right. I think these are things that most people never thought they'd ever have to think about. You know, you go at your job, you're a teacher, you you work at a gas station, you know, you're you do advertising for computers and you never think that what's happening in the economy today is going to actually affect you in real time enough for you to feel it. I think more now more than any time in my life, I'm 42, have I felt like what's happening right now today is going to affect me and my family right now today. So it's important to pay attention, learn about economics, understand what inflation is, its pros, its cons, its benefits, and how it fits into your life. I mean, I, I'm happy that I own rental properties because at least the rent do rise with inflation, even though, right, everything else is going up too. the freaking floor refinishing guys are charging double. And that's even post COVID. They've been charging double, even past that. Everyone's services are, char are, are they're charging more, you know, and at least with real estate for now, rents rise with inflation. If there's, we start to see rent control those wonderful little small gains that we have will start to disappear. So it's yeah. important for people that are watching this and are watching your channel to start paying more attention to economics, start paying attention to your financial situation and think about what might be coming down the pipeline for you and your family and take actions accordingly because Things are affecting your real life right now. And I know for my friends and family, people are feeling right now in their pocketbooks what's happening. They can feel it in real time. And that means it's happening way too fast if you can feel yeah. it this quickly. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. If somebody wanted to follow along and see what you got going on, where do we send them? You can send them to YouTube, Brick by Brick Wealth, or Instagram, Brick by Brick Wealth. Awesome. Casey, you're amazing. Thanks again.